to their first annual Public Banking in America conference. We hope it's annual, and we hope public banking comes to America. It hasn't quite happened yet. We have, we have one public bank in North Dakota, which I'm sure you'll be hearing a lot about. But it, it has happened globally. There are a lot of public <coughs> banking models, and it, ha it happened historically right here in Philadelphia, where um, the Philadelphia Quakers developed the best and most sustainable of the public banking models. Um, I want to thank a huge, sta wonderful staff of uh, people who have helped here. Uh, contrary <coughs> to popular belief, as alleged in the Daily Bell, uh, we are not funded by the CIA, <laughs> and we are not funded by George Soros. In fact, we are not funded at all, except, <laughs> <coughs> except for some... So for some individual contributions to it, of, for which we are very, very grateful. So um, we have a board that's been working really hard for all year. Um, that would be um, Mark Armstrong, who's the executive director. Uh, Bob Bose. Oh, yeah, I should have everybody stand up. Mark Armstrong. Okay. Bob Bose, who, who does uh, video type thing. Uh, Ann Tulintseff, <clears throat> and Mike Krause, and the fine, the wonderful artwork on our program and on our website is was done by Bob Lanfear. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. All, all, all volunteer. We haven't paid for any of this, which is, I mean. <clears throat> it's great that we have this team, but we, we would love to have some funding if anybody has any sources. Um, and then we have uh, an advisory board that's been very helpful, with, uh, which I won't try to introduce. And then we have 23 state reps from various states who have worked really hard at just spreading this idea of public banking. Uh, and they'll have a, we'll have a panel where we'll have some state reps uh, speaking. Um, so. I, I, I want to introduce our first speaker. We're yeah. honored to have uh, Gar Elperovitz here. His uh, accomplishments are so long that I have to read them. <laughs> I can't remember. So he's a historian, political economist, activist, and author. Currently the Lionel R. Bauman Professor of Political Economy at the University of Maryland. His articles have appeared in leading American publications, including the New York Times and Washington Post. He has served as legislative director in both houses of Congress and as special assistant in the State Department, is the president of the National Center for Economic and Security Alternatives, and a founding principal of the Democracy Collaborative, a research institution focused on initiatives that promote the democratization of wealth. His latest book, America Beyond Capitalism, is described by Noam Chomsky as providing concrete and feasible ways to reverse the ominous course of the past several decades and to open the way to a vibrant uh, democracy with a sustainable economy that can satisfy human needs. Uh, welcome, Gar. Hey, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Um, and thank you all for coming. This is a really remarkable occasion. Um, You've asked a political economist and a historian to speak to you. And so I'm going to give you a political economist and a historian's kind of talk and open a kind of broader, I hope a broader perspective on what I think you're doing. The first thing to say is I think this is an extremely important gathering. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe more important, so now this is what I'd like you to think about, maybe more important than any of you have grasped. So that's the kind of opening mind, and I take you all very seriously in, in, as a historian. I think we are entering a period, and why your work is so critical, a period in American history that is opening all of the big questions, maybe for the first time in modern history, maybe for the first time really in American history. So that's a big proposition and why the kind of work that begins this way and builds slowly, step by step, state by state, person by person, 
individual to individual, group to group, why that matters even as it starts in meetings like this and starts, of course, in many other meetings. In one sense, and here's the historical sweep, in one sense, the middle part of the 20th century is kind of an aberration. I'd like you to think about that. The period of time when everything was going so well in America may well have been an aberration in part created by the collapse of the Great Depression, which created a political movement and created a whole series of programs that stabilized the system for a long period. And then World War II bailed out the economy. And the post-war period of great success and great stability that we took for granted was in part the result of those post-war savings that had been accumulated during the war, boosting the economy. It was in part the result of international competitors, Germany, Japan, being destroyed in international competition. So we had a free field for a while. And it was in part the result of the creation of a strong labor movement that for a while worked to achieve such programs as Medicare and Medicaid and began stabilizing the economy with a bargain in a growing economy in the world. All of that, which certainly I took for granted when I was a young person working in the House and Senate and the State Department, is hard to understand as something that was a passing phenomenon and that we are now back to really looking at some of the most fundamental problems any society or any political economy can imagine it could deal with. Profound problems, economic problems, how do you actually manage a system and how do you manage it in a way that builds democracy and sovereignty from the bottom up? How is that done? How do you build and how do you rethink the whole political, economic vision and possibility that we face? That in the 1960s, for those of you one or two gray hairs, I say, that used to be called a heavy rap. <laughs> and it is. So I urge you to see that what we're talking about in public banking and many other elements, which I will refer to and you all know about, reaches deeply into the nature of where we're going and where we might want to be going and how we can proceed in an extremely complex and difficult time. The other side of the coin of what I've just said might be put this way, and again, hard to grasp fully. If the middle part of the century of prosperity and reforms and achievements was somewhat of an aberration, if you look before the decay in the early part of the century, we may now be entering a period of ongoing, longer term stagnation, stalemate politically, and decay, plus the new problem that has grown into awareness, ecological sustainability becoming a real problem, and the challenge of climate change forcing us to ask even deeper questions. Now, what does that mean, a period of stagnation where the economy doesn't boost beyond ripples, but it doesn't collapse as it did in the Great Depression? An ongoing period when there is more and more environmental challenge, an ongoing period where there are more and more fiscal problems and more and more financial problems, but not collapse, very strange viewed from a historical perspective. But we're beginning to sense what that means. We are living in that context now. And people understand, and this is critical, that one of the results of the context, the failing of the dominant institutions, the failings of the economy, the failings of the banking system, the failings of the job system, the failings of the environmental world, enters our consciousness. We know something is wrong. And so do many, many Americans and many people around the world. What I want you to focus on, what I'd like to suggest as a way to think about where we're going at this conference, is over time, after some defeats, there is more and more knowledge built up, more and more experimentation, 
more people learning how to do things, and then more advances, more sophisticated development, like this Cleveland model, which is certainly not the end of the line. There will be more and more sophisticated things developing out of that. So that there is a process underway, illustrated in this case by democratizing ownership in that realm, that gives you a sense of what might happen. And recently, and this is another part of how a historian looks at what goes on and what may go on out of this meeting and out of what you all have been doing so far. And recently, the International Steel Union, which had worked together with the major corporations to destroy this cooperative effort in 1977, has now announced that it is for worker cooperatives in the United States along this line. So a major shift. So if you stand back, I am not a utopian. And I urge us all not to be utopians. On the other hand, as a historian and a realist, it is possible in many realms to discern the potential for rebuilding from the bottom up over time and then beginning to generate ideas that suggest a new way forward once we see ourselves not simply as advocates, not simply as people who know a lot about public banking, but actors in history. Good place to start, Philadelphia. Well chosen, very well chosen. Not surprising that you chose this place and important. You're beginning, I think, to get a sense of uh, where I'm coming from, in any case, I hope. But I'd like to suggest beyond that, the challenges are very, very interesting, but the opportunities are also very interesting. My sense of what might be possible, so I offer you now a potential vision. Given the context, if everything was hunky-dory, as we used to say, I'm from Racine, Wisconsin, if everything was hunky-dory, we used to use, it. anybody use that phrase anymore? <laughs> uh, if everything was fine, you would not find many people asking the kind of questions that are being asked. But if everything is not fine, people want to know for new answers. They want to know what's going on in housing and why has the banking system been doing what it's been doing. They want to know why the kinds of businesses that ought to be financed and environmentally is, aren't being financed and why they personally are being charged the way they're charged. Lots of questions in that realm and why the jobs don't change and why the environment is so poisonous, and why we may go, and questions get asked. The analogy is not perfect, but the process that you see in this little illustration I gave you about Ohio, I think is a process we're likely to see developing on the one hand. There is another hand. Harry Truman used to say, I, I don't want, I want one-handed economists. <laughs> 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 but there is another hand. And the other hand is that, as you all know better than I do, there are also crisis events developing. It is not simply a process that is opening up and challenging people over time. The, finan the financial crisis opened a big door in American consciousness, as well as a big wound in American society. That's not the slow accumulation model. That is the crisis model. And I suspect, and I know a number of the people here are experts, I don't know any financial experts who believe there will not be further financial crises. So that's another aspect. And when the next crisis occurs, the big ones, or the next one beyond that, then the political system will say, you know, this regulatory strategy that we've tried Regulatory strategy, those of you who know the, the, the loopholes in the regulatory strategy better than I, uh, this sort of regulatory strategy, they will say, and they're already saying, and I applaud them for saying it, we ought to break them up, break up the big guys. That would be a good thing to do. I'm for that. And as a historian, it only takes about two seconds to think about this, what you know is once they're broken up, the big fish will eat the little fish and they'll be right back at the trough. That's the way antitrust works. 
You break them up and then the powerful begin to assemble more power and then they get back to where they're going. I think that will happen. That's a quote prediction, right? You know what predictions are worth. Take a look at it. I think what we're going to see is that process at the level of crisis, which means partially if it goes in that direction, which I think is highly likely over the next decade, that the question of the entire financial system will be on the table because if you don't break them up, what do you do? And if they get back and assemble the political power to recontrol the regulatory system and the regulatory system can't manage it, what do you do? I think the issue of public banking is going to come powerfully to the surface, particularly, think about that process in Ohio, particularly if step by step Serious work has been done, both at the level of getting some of this on the table, actually building on the North Dakota model, actually developing practical experiences, trial and error, there's going to be some errors, count on it, no problem, we can learn from that if we have a historical vision, and then beginning to build up the knowledge and the sophistication of what it means to deal with a systemic problem of this kind. You may have noticed I'm asking you to stretch beyond the public model we're now looking at to take on some of the larger issues that Ellen has written about. Where does the whole system go over time? What is our larger historical vision? How do we build it up? And how do we prepare step by step for what we know will be the ongoing crisis in the system at the level of locality, at the level of state, the level of nation, the level of region. If we are not going to do that, who is? People in this room are at the cutting edge of this movement. And so I urge you to take a larger view of where we go and why we're stepping up now. I would also add, it is a larger movement, really, than exists in this room. And so we need to reach out beyond public banking to the allies who care about the same things, who are beginning to think, how do we build communities from the bottom up? How do we deal with equity issues? It cannot be that 400 people maintain that position forever compared with the rest of society. How do we deal with ecology, building from the bottom up and also thinking about systemic issues? So there are people, it's not simply the Occupy movement, there are parts of the environmental movement, there are parts of the financial movement. John Fullerton, my good friend is here, is going to talk about that. There are people who are beginning to see in different parts of the country different pieces of this puzzle that must be dealt with together. And that requires us to stretch, requires us to reach out to new allies. There is something building also that I think gets us beyond traditional left and right. In the Cleveland model, you find local, very conservative businessmen, small businessmen in that area, liberals, radical activists, coming together and saying, this makes sense. Helps the community, changes the distribution, is ecologically solid, is strong, stabilizes the base of the economy. That kind of possibility, I think, is very real in many, many parts of the country, in many, many dimensions, if we broaden who we are. That's not easy. So I want to give you another piece of this quote, hard rap. It requires us to study beyond where we are, to talk to people we don't usually talk to, and to begin to see we are going to be successful. Right, let me say that again. Lots of people actually in their heart of hearts are not so sure, including us and our friends. The possibility that actually over time in this context <clears throat> we shall overcome, I contend, is a real possibility and needs to be taken seriously from the perspective of a historic actor like the people in this room. If you do that, I suspect you'll find a lot of other folks out there who are having the same kinds of questions emerging in their own realm and all basically looking at it from the same perspective we build a society that restores American communities, that restores the ecological basis of the community, changes the equity patterns, is very much in keeping with the American history. One of the wonders of this society 
really a wonder is that we are so decentralized you look at France or Germany or England those are centralized systems with a powerful state we were started in a decentralized way the states are highly decentralized the communities are much more decentralized we have more of a possibility of building a community sustaining society than any other advanced system in the world if we take it seriously because our history is so decentralized very big deal we need to focus on it having said that so here are a couple of the hard places many there are many hard places but I want to give you some uh, nasty challenges what do you do about big industry the big corporations way out as we overcome as we shall overcome lots of things can be done at the local level I'm a Schumacher follower small is beautiful but I urge you there's some Schumacher folks to read part four of that wonderful book Schumacher small is beautiful was interested in appropriate technology not all technologies are small did anybody fly here in an airplane Can anybody come on a train Do you drive a car who made your computer and who made the chips there are many things that require larger scale we have we we are much in need of a study of what really requires scale and what is simply financial manipulation but there are some things so what do you do about the big guys in the long vision to which we're pointing and to which I'm urging you to point at some point like these big banks if you can't regulate them what do you do I think we're going to come around where we're going to talk about public utilities for some of the big guys now that's quite controversial but the reason I say it is not only that they have such power I worked in both houses of Congress the lobbyists swarm they swarm with their checkbooks and they come well financed and they come with power one of the reasons I say that some of these guys ultimately are going to have to be made into public utilities tough question is their power but another is the following we are really reaching the end of growth either we find a way all of us to delimit the ongoing resource using climate change and growth patterns or we will be wiped away or destroyed by those patterns we know that climate change is real resource limits are real and the big guys as they are now structured must meet Wall Street expectations for quarterly returns and they better damn grow or they're out of business now it may be possible I'm hoping we'll hear more about this later to change the financial relationships and alter that pattern very tough in a global market to do that if you're forced up against quarterly returns you must grow unless you can change that pattern my hunch is it's going to end up at some point that some of these institutions too big to handle and too destructive of climate those institutions I think some of them are going to be utilities now that's a tough rap that's down the load but I'm I guess what I want to ask you again to do is to stand back if you think about this as a historian or a political economist and honestly ask yourself what do we really mean what do we think can really be done are we just going to say we're going to tend our garden here or are we part of something larger those are the kinds of questions to which none of us have final answers that we all as part of a growing and building movement must a must answer people in this room I think are at the heart of the matter because unless the financial system is altered in some fundamental way nothing is going to really change so again I remind you of the importance of this meeting and of the initiatives you've already taken the larger question and here it gets I drop my hat as a historian and political economist to you uh, entirely none of this actually has anything to do so you know here's the other hand the one hand two hand none of this actually has to do with history none of this has to do with politics none of this has to do with public banking none of this has to do with um, political economy what it has to do I'm talking to the person in your chair it has to do with 
existential questions. In other words, what are we as individuals personally willing to do? The bottom line is existential. We all know there's something wrong. You wouldn't be here and you wouldn't be doing what you're doing and you wouldn't be trying to get other folks involved if you didn't understand that. So why I'm so pleased to be with you at this founding meeting again is because people in this room have already faced the existential question. In other words, I'm going to do something about it. I'm not going to just sit back and critique. I'm not going to sit back and moan. I'm actually going to roll up my sleeves and get out there and do something. So first, my applause to you all. Give yourself a hand. And secondly, I, I want to, my applause for being, for, for being here and for the organizers. Uh, I'm going to, they've asked me to, to cut my remarks to about this length so that we can have time for discussions. But I do want to close by saying and reminding you all that where we sit in Philadelphia was a founding of a great possibility. And I think this possibility, as it expands, is going to expand well beyond this room to the next conference and the next conference and the next conference beyond. Thank you very much. And anyone that uh, has a question, just raise your hand. I'll come around. We'll take you in order. We've got about 10 minutes or so uh, to ask our questions. <coughs> Hi, I'm Laura Wells from California, and uh, I, you sort of answered it as you went along, but I'm, I'm still curious, why do you think it will not just collapse? It's a very good question, um, and th there's a very straightforward answer. The, in 1929, the U.S. government's share of the economy, all governments, state, local, and national, was 11 percent. That was the floor under which that held up the economy, and it was a very low floor. Currently, it's 34% if the economy were running at high speed. There is a substantial economic floor by virtue of the fact that the government has become so much triple the size, so much bigger. So that's one reason why it's unlikely to collapse in the way it did in 1929. It doesn't mean it won't collapse in, de in decay. That's why I say stagnation and decay rather than full collapse. The other is Keynesian ideas have gotten somewhere in the United States that you're going to begin to see using, you know, George Bush was doing public stimulus spending. So there's an attempt to stabilize. So I suspect they will try whatever they can to keep it managed and the underlying floor is likely to prevent the kind of collapse we had at that point. Good, good question. Hi, I'm Dan Jones from uh, Vermont. You were mentioning before that you thought certain uh, major industries will actually continue. Do you, you know, you were mentioning, I think, airplanes, uh, automobiles, uh, et cetera, uh, steel. Do you actually think that our future is contains those, or are they so resource uh, dependent that we are going to actually have to redefine ourselves in terms of an industrial culture? Well, that's a very good question. I actually didn't say that those firm, those industries would con have to continue. Those are the ones we're now using that are big. They're illustrations. Um, or, for instance, in large cities, mass transit and high-speed rail might be the next industries. The question that's being asked is a very good question to which I have not been able to find any research done in a serious way. So, in, in fact, it, as my, the Thomas Hanna, who works with us, a research person, I keep asking him to look for studies of which industries must be large, which now and in future. That's a critical question for future development. And I, it depends how long you go, and I don't know which ones. I think no one, no one that I've yet been able to find, we're really working on this problem, has been able to answer your question. So put it on the list of things that we have got to do. This um, I was wondering if you could comment on how we can bring together the public banking effort with um, the Cleveland model, how these two things can come together. One, one, of, one of the ways that can come together, uh, Ruth Kaplan in Washington, D.C., getting the mayor right now <coughs> and the mayor's commission and the, the Green Ribbon Committee in, in uh, Washington, D.C., is getting, trying to get the mayor and indeed has succeeded to a certain degree of getting a commitment to try to move in this direction partially. Now, the public banking side is not yet as advanced as the Cleveland side. So the public banking part of it could actually support the kinds of developments we're talking about. 
hand in glove. But what's really interesting is the attempt to actually to put this on the agenda and the recent statements of the mayor's commission, the mayor's group uh, looking to the future have begun to suggest we may be able to do that with a lot more work in a city, in a city like Washington. So probably other cities can do it as well. Uh, John Root from Common Good Finance in Massachusetts. Uh, during the talk, you referred a number of times to Occupy Wall Street, and I would be very interested in what your assumption about Occupy, <coughs> about the Occupy movement is. If, rather than just referring to it, how do you see that, uh, the role that it could play? And I participate every week in our General Assembly in the Berkshires, and we're very clear that we don't want to come up with the solutions until we've really understood what's going on. So, uh, big question. How do I, I'm glad, you, I'm glad you asked it this way. How do I see Occupy rather than what is the future of Occupy? Yeah, which would right. be a very much harder thing to say. Um, a couple, couple things to say. In many parts of the country, Occupy groups are really actually doing just what he said, studying. I'm a big believer in study groups, study action groups. That is to say, people, I often say this, Chairman Mao said social change comes out of the barrel of a gun. And in the 1960s, the, the American women's movement said, no, 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 no. Change comes out of six people getting together, six women getting together, a cup of coffee, reading some books, supporting each other, and then finding something to act on in their local community and building from there. So I take the latter position. The Occupy groups that I've been talking to are now getting more and more engaged in two questions. The reading, stuff we're talking about is big and serious stuff. You need to learn about it and think about it. They're reading and talking, <clears throat> and they're looking for things they can do locally or in their own state tomorrow that engage them with the people and engage real problems. That, I think, is the big process. Not simply to act, but to think about where, where do you go in the largest political economic <clears throat> system in the history of the world? This is a powerful political economic system. It is not simply one small project in one community. So you need to think, you need to walk on two legs, as the Chinese say. You need to think what can be done here, but also how do you address that problem? And I see some of the, some of the Occupy folks doing that. I think some of them won't. Some of them will fritter away this opportunity. Probably the most important thing about the Occupy movements among young people, I was recent, recently addressed the conference at Harvard, they are part of the process I was talking about. Something has happened to make them aware the larger context has made them aware that something is really profoundly wrong, and secondly, that they better do something. That's what I'm talking about, the context helping shift our understanding. So I don't know. I think uh, what you may see is some of them will act, and some of them may bear that understanding in mind and not know what to do, and then see an opportunity and act. We shall see. But I think on the whole, there's been a real big shift in consciousness that's very important. Oh, I'm Two Connie. more questions, but they have to be short, he just said. Hi. I'm, I'm Connie Belay from Philadelphia. Um, <clears throat> what do you see as the leverage we have against the, the legal system which holds all of this in place. And I'm thinking in the context of since the 1970s, it, you know, experiencing on the ground, working in the private sector, that the ownership of intellectual property started becoming really important in the 70s and has been locked up. And I believe that's one of the ways that the accumulation of wealth has happened as it has, because every programmer's programs belong to the corporation, which then accumulates it up until it's a real lock on these high technologies. So how do you begin unbundling a, a, a legal system that protects that and makes every ununionized private worker sign these intellectual agreements and give up the ownership of their brain power? I don't have the answer, but I do know that there's a whole open source movement trying to build there are many lawyers working on precisely this question. Who, look, there's people at Harvard and Stanford have been writing books about how to challenge it. There are probably people in this room who can answer that question better than I do. But I do know that the answer will come if people 
will only come when people both get in, into the concrete question legally, but also begin being participants in this larger movement. Uh, it would, those two things together are going to have to do it. Probably someone in this room knows more than I do about this subject. One more question, I think. Yes, sir. Okay. <clears throat> One more. Hi. Um, my name is uh, Tim O'Neill. I'm with the Progressive Democrats of America in New Jersey and Occupy Trenton. Uh, since the 70s, corporations and uh, Congress have been trying to privatize the Postal Service and eliminating unions and Amtrak. So my question is, since you mentioned the ESOPs, do you think it would be a viable solution to make the Postal Service and Amtrak uh, ESOPs? Whether you understand, in other words, make them into a worker-owned company. Yes, worker-owned company. Uh, I haven't, I have, I haven't thought that through uh, totally, and I, 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 I suspect there may be a role for the model we've been looking at is in in the case of very large questions like Amtrak, which is a public service, that the, and the post office. The model we've been looking at in terms of public utilities, which is the term I use, the term of art. Uh, that's a term of art which covers many, many different possibilities is joint ventures. That is to say, um, the steel workers have come up with union and unions in co-ops. That's not the common model. The ESOP model may open the door for unions and joint ventures with public utilities. This is an area, by the way, what's really interesting about it, if those of you want to get into it, these structural forms, different institutional ways of combining the public interest and combining cooperative structure, there's a whole industry now, I'll give you a website on this, that is beginning to explore the pros and cons of these different models. That model may be one to look at in that case, or the pure public. The pure public has some negatives, obviously, but the model of putting worker participation in the way that the Mondragon does it in a larger structure may very well be appropriate in certain cases. The website is www.community-wealth. Be sure to put the dash in, because there's another one without the dash. I think my time is up. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.